do I have a treat for you? I have someone who has been a champion and she she does it comedy though too. Humor. Sometimes you gotta laugh to keep from crying. I have the one and only amazing Liz Winstead here with us, our first interview during our premiere week. Liz, it is so good to have you here. I want to remind people in 1996, you were the co-creator of The Daily Show on Comedy Central. In 2012, you founded the Abortion Access Front, an organization dedicated to raising awareness about attempts to block you know, women's reproductive rights. And you are the co-host of Feminist Buzzkill Live. I want people to, wherever they get their podcast, to tune in. But you and I first met nationally at a Planned Parenthood event where you were doing what you do. I was a board member for the national at at once upon a time, seems like so many lifetimes ago. And as we were discussing when I ran for Secretary of State in 2014, you and Ali Sheedy and so many others were right there by my side. Mm-hmm. Helping me to run that race. It was like running through hell with gasoline clothing on Liz. I want to Ugh, I mean, it is it's so I'm glad you opened up the segment talking about Medicare for all because I'm I'm with you 100 percent on it always and forever. And as we look at this abortion fight we are in, if we were to have Medicare for all in in the most profound and equitable way, low income folks would not have to be searching and paying for the reproductive care. Uh, you know, there is so much going on right now, Nina, that it is. I just feel like sometimes I feel like it's a tsunami of a of oppression that just just doesn't stop. And so I feel for people who are like, what do I do? Where do I go? I don't know what to do. And that's why we started abortion access front, man. People need something to do because they don't know where the fight is. That's right, and and you framed it correctly. I mean, just this, it is in fact a tsunami. And why of all of the issues, all of the pressing issues, because there's so many, and none of us can tackle all of them. You know, people right. have the issues that are the nearest and dearest to their hearts. Doesn't mean they don't care about the other issues, but people have their top three. They care about other things. For you, why is it reproductive care access abortion? I'm gonna say the A word. Yeah, why abortion. Is it that? You know, I think because for so long it wasn't anywhere, right? No one was talking about it. And so when you don't talk about an issue, uh, the anti abortion movement got to frame this issue for 50 years. And so they stigmatized it, they took it out of the healthcare conversation, and they took it out of the economic conversation. And so when I hear people say things like, People really should be focusing on economic issues. I'm like, if you do not think bodily autonomy and how and when and if you have the capacity to start a family is not an economic issue, that just shows me how much we have to learn and why this issue needs to be centered. Because truth be told, you do not live as a free American citizen. If somebody has decided your body, can be compromised and controlled by government entities. It is a mess. And it wasn't until Roe fell that the media started talking about it. I mean, Joe Biden just started saying the word abortion in 2022. So when we talk about how the Republicans are monsters, which they are, we also need to hold ourselves accountable about how much we didn't talk about it, how much we allowed other things and the shame to come in around it. And we need to do a big reset, man, on what we're talking about here. Yeah, agreed on that, Liz. I think because people don't automatically make the connection with abortion or reproductive health too, because contraception, you know, you got these crazy A Republicans trying to take away a woman's right to even have get birth control pills for God's sakes. That could be a whole nother show in and of itself. But I think making the connection, the economic connection is important. And those of us in this space have not done a really a great job of making the connection as to why abortion is in fact an economic issue along with the other, I can't afford gas and I can't afford my food. All of those things are important. So speaking of President Biden, he has announced that he will make codifying Roe a top priority next year if the Democrats hold power in Congress. 
this is good news and I say somewhat. Yeah, how do you feel about it? And do you accept the excuses from the president and the Congress that is in control by Democrats right now about why they haven't been fighting harder? Now, I understand the recalcitrance of the Republicans, and I also understand that we got two problem children. I think a, a few more than two. I think some other Democrats are hiding behind those two, but I'm talking about Senators. Mansion and cinema. And before you answer that, Liz, I want to put up these two graphics. So, in, in fundraisers and in political speeches, the president certainly has vowed to reject any abortion restrictions that may come to his desk in a GOP controlled Congress, like he did on Tuesday. Biden has also urged voters to boost the Democratic ranks in the Senate so enough senators would not only support re reinstating abortion nationwide. But would change Senate rules to do that, and that's coming from uh, the AP. What what do you think about that? You know, Nina, I think for far too long we have given Democrats a pass when they say, and that's exactly the problem. That statement: I will veto any block. Expected, expected. But unless you're telling me, I will proactively. Expand access to care, make sure that I am expanding the rights for people to have it. It's very much like if it, when you're, you can't just say, you have to be an anti racist, right? If you're really gonna yeah. be in the game, you have to be an anti racist. You can't, you have to stand up to it, you have to be profoundly vocal about it, you have to be an advocate that steps up and, and allows uh, folks who are oppressed to step back so you can advocate. It's the same with this. You have to say, I am proactive in my messaging and in my advocacy for reproductive rights. Otherwise, it's hollow and otherwise we're just on the defensive and it goes back to sort of that shamey weirdness of like, you if you can't say abortion, you can't defend it. What are you defending? Yeah. When people go in and they need services, they don't say I need a pro-choice. They say I need an abortion. Yeah, isn't that that's true? very important. It is very important. And I love the word that you use proactive because I'm a little miffed about that statement. I believe that Democrats should have raised hell deep more, more deeply than mm -hmm. they did on mm -hmm. this issue, knowing that we can't continue to make excuses. You have the majority, it's a slim majority, but you got the majority. That's what you asked people for in 2020. And you cannot continue to say, oh, but I need a little more. Now we know technically what's happening in that Congress. But as far as I'm concerned, they waited too long to get a clue, and that includes the President of the United States of America. On a, on a better note, though, we know that the state of California has an initiative on the ballot, Liz, and they're not the only one, but we're talking about Proposition 1 uh, to add the right to reproductive freedom to their constitution. Now, the state already, uh, uh, the state in the state of California, woman's right to have at that access is already there. But advocates have been pushing to put that extra layer by putting it in the Constitution. I mean, this is a, a really beautiful thing that is happening in that state, and other places are doing the same thing. It's great. And it is not only are they doing that, Gavin Newsom, their governor, has been putting up billboards in Texas and states where access has been decimated saying come to California we'll help you get there we'll pay help you pay for your abortion we're here for you without shame and stigma it's kind of amazing because Nina I think the part that is the most unsettling is you expect the worst from people who are the worst mm -hmm. but when our lives are on the line I have had it with Democrats bringing a PowerPoint presentation to a knife fight. This Hello. is no joke, man. This is Hello. no joke. Yeah, I'm with you on that list. I, I totally am. They got to get a little gangster. Yes. You know, Republicans got gangsters. I had one of my one of my supporters say, you know, Democrats ain't got no gangsters on their side. GOP got all the gangsters, and we yeah. have none. You said they bringing a PowerPoint <laughs> to the to the fight. <laughs> to fight. What a nice fight! They bring in a damn PowerPoint. Now, Liz, you wrote you had, you wrote an opinion piece in the Daily Beast, and this is what you said. I want to put this up because I want you to react to it. You said on January 6th, insurrectionists attacked the U.S. Capitol and brought into sharp focus a threat. Those of us who have been monitoring right-wing extremists have understood for years 
some of the people who either attended the siege of the Capitol or played or played cheerleader for it to their thousands of followers on social media were the exact same dangerous extremists who harass and threaten patients and doctors daily at reproductive health centers, including some of the biggest stars of the pro life movement. You meant no words there, Liz. Nope. Now I think there's an intersection between what happened during the insurrection on January the 6th and the people who call themselves pro-life. Well, Nina, here's what's cool is through our advocacy at Abortion Access Front, we started out and part of what we do is we travel around the country and we do shows and we stay in communities for four or five days and work with the local activists on the ground. And as we were doing that, and we've been to over 100 cities. And as we were doing that, they would talk to us about the extremists outside of the clinics and they would give us their names. And we started forming a database. And then we started do using aliases to join their churches, join their Facebook pages, and we started following their movements. And we started um, pulling screenshots and going to videotape them when they started protesting at clinics. We've been doing this for five years. So we have amassed the largest anti abortion extremist database in the movement. Wow. So when we saw the rumblings of January 6th, we started watching them making their plans. And so when when January 6th rolled around, we pulled footage and stills before they could take it down of them being there. And we identified and turned over to the FBI 30 anti-abortion people. And then and then we just through our research and work um, we just got 11 anti abortion extremists who were harassing clinics um, indicted on federal charges. Good so, for you, Liz. Yeah. I, I, yeah, you're, the work that you're doing and, and how you're also using satire and comedy, you're calling on your colleagues who are experts in that arena along with you to help push this issue, elevate this issue, and educate people as to why they should care about it. Liz Winstead, thank you so much for using your gifts. Make this world a better. I see a lot of you here on the show, and congratulations on the new show. I'm so excited.